Hello, and welcome to chapter five, the third learning objective, where we're gonna be talking about recording sales under a perpetual inventory system. As well, you might hear Bambi in the background. She has been particularly talkative today. Uh, I think she is seeing all types of squirrels and neighborhood cats that she would like to, I don't know, uh, defend our house from. Any hoodles. When talking about the sales of merchandise, uh, this is, you know, happens when we are perpetually recording inventory. That is, two entries have to happen each time, one to record the sales revenue and one to record the cost of the merchandise sold. So for example, if we were to sell uh, some, we pretend we're Loblaws and we're selling strawberries. I don't even know anymore. Um, I would be getting how much cash from you? What feels like $20 every single time I want some strawberries. And <laughs> um, they would earn that in revenue. However, that's not what it costs them. So we need to recognize the cost of goods sold and it probably costs them, I don't know, what feels like $3 to buy the strawberries. Um, and so then we would be reducing their inventory. They no longer have $3 worth of strawberry inventory uh, because they sold them to me for $20. So the difference between what they sold these for and what it cost them that difference, revenues minus cost of goods sold, that's actually equal to their gross profit. So this number must be greater than this number, otherwise they're losing money on, on their sales. They're not even including all the other items, um, you know, their CEO salaries or anything like that. This number has to be greater than this number, otherwise they're losing money on strawberry sales. All right. So friendly reminder, we do not record sales tax um, as a part of the revenue, and that is because it will be held to a separate account and remitted net of what they collect. So however much sales tax they receive from their sales minus um, sales tax that they pay. And also friendly reminder that when the freight is FOB destination, the seller records the cost of the freight as an operating expense because the seller is the one um, that is on the hook until it gets to the destination, that would be an operating expense. So interesting that when you're buying it, it is a cost of goods sold, because it's an inventory, but when you're paying it, it's an operating expense. So then that would go underneath the cost of goods sold um, in between gross profit and net profit. So interesting. I could see this being like a good little test question. Any hoodles. Um, and I say that not having refreshed my memory of the test recently. All right, so sales of merchandise, sale um, returns and allowances. When you're selling, if we are talking about IFRS, uh, International Financial Reporting uh, Standards, then the sales would be recognized net of estimated returns. So if we sell 100, but historically we always receive um, three, three dollars out of, out of every hundred um, as a return, then we can only recognize 97 as sales. Uh, conversely, um, you're probably going to receive money for those sales, even though we're like, mm -hmm, three out of every hundred of you are going to return these. Then we take that cash, we hold on to it, and we book the liability for that. Similarly, uh, there's an asset account and there would be um, an estimated inventory returns as a way to record uh, the cost of goods uh, expected to be returned. So let's take a look at that in our summary. When recording inventory sales, we have all of our cash that we received or expect to receive as a debit, thank you so much, uh, so that $100, uh, and then our credit would be to the sales net of what we expect to be returned. So our 97, and then we expect three to be returned, and that's our refund liability. Again, you can put these as two separate journal entries, uh, one debit cash for 100, sales of um, 100, and then, um, or sorry, debit cash or accounts receivable 97, debit 
credit sales of 97 and then debit cash or air of three and credit refund liability of three or you can do them net where they're just one big journal entry together either or it works um remember you're selling to customers you also have to recognize the cost of goods sold as your um, 97 you're estimating the returns of those three that three that's typically refunded and then you're reducing your um, your inventory by 100. So 100, this is actually estimated inventory returns, is going to be um, a sub-account to your inventory. So this net inventory uh, decrease would be, um, would be that inventory less the amount of sales proportionate to the refund liability. So say the refund liability was three, your inventory returns is not three. Unless your sales equal your cost of goods sold and you're not looking to make any money, this estimate inventory returns will typically always be less than your refund liability. All right, and then if somebody actually does a return uh, something, then we get to reverse out that refund liability because it's happening. And then we just give them back their money. So here it's, we're literally just waiting for them to come back and we're like, aha, I told you so. Um, and then we give them back their money and we credit our cash. Um, then we get to restock that cost of that inventory that they returned. So therefore we restock it, our inventory goes up, and then we get to draw down from that allowance uh, that we created that uh, estimate account. All right, um, friendly reminder, we are paying the freight costs on sales at Bell Beauty Destination because we're now selling it. We have to incur this freight out will be an operating expense. So not cost of goods sold, operating expense called freight out expense apparently. And then our cash or AP uh, would be credited. Happy days, um, we made a sale um, that was on account and the customers paid us, our cash goes up and our accounts receivable amount goes down. Time for some practice. A customer returns undamaged goods to Magna Stereos Limited, a public company that were sold for $200 on account. Magna Stereos uses a perpetual inventory system. Assuming the cost of goods sold was $125, the journal entry or entries for Magna Stereos to record the return would be I'll see you in Excel. So we have two parts that we're gonna to have to record. One is the sales return, and the other is going to be the inventory restocking. So first, the amount of the sales return, well that would be the $200, and they bought it on account, so we're going to debit the refund liability by $200. They would have already booked part of the guests, part of all the sales that they're going to do. They're going to have that refund liability set up. And then they're like, cool, um, thank you so much. Um, we're no longer expecting you to pay us this much. So therefore, our accounts receivable will go down. And that is to reflect the sales return. And now we have our inventory restocking. And just for, for future, I'm saying account, amount, and reason. So now for our inventory restocking, I get to put my debit inventory back on the shelf. And that was the inventory that was 125. Again, a lot of students will make a little mistake and put 200, but no, your inventory costs you less than what you're selling it for, because that's how you're making money. And then you are gonna credit the estimate that you made on this, the estimated inventory returns of 125 and this is to record your uh, inventory restocking amount cool how'd you do all right well that's it, it for this video i'm going to return with one last video looking at learning objective number four we'll talk soon